it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Chris Pearson to this event, who's going to be speaking about some of the technologies that are being developed uh, just south of Oxford. Uh, so Chris is in the astronomy group um, at RAL and part of this aerial consortium and is working on all sorts of things, uh, ground-based astronomy, including the square kilometre array that's a telescope that's a square kilometre wide. Um, but I'm sure you'll find out about that and much more. We are recording the event and there is an opportunity to ask questions. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. That will allow us to keep track of questions that have been asked and which ones have been answered. Um, but please sit back, enjoy and, uh, and meet Chris. So over to you. Okay, so thanks for inviting me to talk today. So my name's Chris. I work at RAL Space, which is just down the road from Oxford in Harwell. And um, today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, alien worlds and also a little bit about what space missions we're building to uh, discover and um, look at these alien worlds. But uh, before I start, I'm going to go a little bit um, closer to home, first of all. Um, and looking back in history, what, this is what we called the seven classical planets, the planets of antiquity. And at that time, you know, these are all the things that we could see in the night sky with the, with the naked eye. And, and likewise today, the, you don't need a telescope to see these things in the sky. Um, obviously, you shouldn't be looking at the sun, which is not a planet anyway. Um, and then we've got the moon, which is also not a planet. And then we've got the, the five planets we, you can see um, with your naked eye in the sky, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus and, and Saturn. So this is where we were kind of like, you know, in the ancient times, then we built telescopes and we discovered uh, that our solar system actually included, um, you know, more planets than just what we could see with the naked eye. We've got, um, we added uh, Uranus and, and Neptune, um, but also we had, you know, we had Pluto as well, it used to be a planet discovered in 1930. But we all probably know now that uh, that's changed. Pluto has been kicked out of the planet club, unfortunately. Um, this happened in 2006 in a big meeting in the International Astronomy Union in the city of Prague. There was about 500 astronomers who were there um, and we actually had three votes um, because it was so difficult and it was quite, it was quite contentious. There was a lot of arguments going on for that. We had the one vote and we couldn't decide, two votes we couldn't decide, third vote we decided that Pluto was not a planet and poor old Pluto got kicked out of the planet club. But so that left us with eight planets in our solar system. Um, and, and this is what a lot of people, you know, we learn at school, eight planets in the solar system. But when we look up at the night sky and, you know, we, 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 see, we see the sky full of stars or even full of galaxies, which are, which are cities of stars. So it's, it's very difficult to um, believe or imagine that um, indeed these eight planets are the only planets in the universe. You know, looking at the number of stars in the sky, there must be more planets around other stars we would think but it took quite a long time you know for this fact to be proved and in fact um all the way up until about um nine in, in the 1990s before that we thought there were only um, um eight or nine planets in in the in the universe some people thought uh, but that all changed in 1992 the first planets were discovered that went around other stars um it was a bit weird because we discovered three planets um uh, in 1992 and they were all going around what we call a pulsar star now a pulsar is not a normal star a pulsar is actually what happens when a very big star ends its life it explodes in a supernova big explosion and then what's left behind is kind of like the remnants the ash of what the star used to be um these these really tiny dense objects called pulsars now pulsars gives off loads of deadly radiation so these three planets that were discovered, um, there's, there's, there's not life or not life as we know it on these planets. But this was groundbreaking. This was amazing because this was the first planets discovered around another star outside our solar system. So around other suns. But then you know, where there's one, there's another. And the next one came up quite quick. Three years later in 1995, we discovered um, the first planet uh, that went around a sun-like star. And we've got here, um, We've got here a, a, a kind of like a comparison here. We've got Jupiter on the left here and this new planet that was discovered, 51 Pegasi B. So it's bigger than Jupiter and Jupiter's the biggest planet in our solar system. The actual star itself, 51 Pegasi, is around about the same size as our sun. So it's the same sort of star as our, as our sun. 
Okay. So this was the first planet that was really discovered going around another star like our sun, but in a distant, um, a, a distant part of our galaxy. And although discovered in 1995, um, last year, um, this was actually part of one of the Nobel um, prizes um, for, for physics. And um, this was awarded to um, Didier Curlotz and Michael Mayer, who shared the prize along with um, um, Jim Peebles for uh, a different different part of um, uh, astronomy. So this was really so it's 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 made you know this this star or exoplanets as we call them um, planets around other stars a bit more famous. So now we know they exist. How many do we think there are in the universe? So I know it's I know it's Saturday. And those of you, if there's children joining in, it's not school time, okay? But we, you know, I'm going to do a little bit of maths, okay? So here we've got a picture, uh, not of the entire universe, just of a patch of sky. And there's about 100,000 galaxies in this picture. And you can, you know, you can go back afterwards, you can try and count the dots. There's about 100,000 dots on this picture, take my word for it. Every dot's not a star. Every dot is a galaxy. So a galaxy, um, like our own galaxy, the Milky Way, each galaxy, so each dot on this picture contains about 100 billion stars in it. So every dot on that big picture also contains 100 billion stars, okay? Now, if we just make, if we just make a guess, let's just say that every star has one planet going around it. And that's pretty conservative because we know that our sun has got 11, um, eight planets going around it. So let's just say that one, one star, one planet, keep it nice and simple. Now, this picture is about, 16 moons big so a moon the moon if you look up at the sky the moon is about the size of your thumb on the sky so if you put your thumb to the sky and you counted how many thumbs would be needed to fill up the whole sky um you know it's the sky is about 160,000 thumbs or moons big okay again you can try that uh, if you want to. Uh, so this, so we've got our numbers now. We've got all the numbers we need to sort of get a rough estimate of how many planets there are in the universe. Okay, so we've got a little bit of maths, 100,000 galaxies times 100 billion stars times 10,000 patches of sky of that size that I showed. And we put that all together. That's this number of planets. And it's just a pretty big number. That's, that's um, one followed by one, two, three, it's followed by about 20 zeros. And that number has a name, I've been told, it's 100 quintillion planets, at least, because we assumed there was one planet going around every star. So if we assume there's eight planets going around every star, like our sun and our solar system, then we'd have 800 quintillion planets. So if you go away from anything from today, then you know roughly how many planets there are in, in the universe, 100 quintillion at least. So how do we go about finding these planets? Um, luckily, we've got a whole fleet of spacecraft now that are looking for these, um, looking for these planets. And in fact, um, you know, some of these have flown already. Some of them have finished. Um, some of them are flying now. And some of them are planned for the, the future. And all the ones on the bottom of this picture here, these are spacecraft or satellites that their main job was not to find exoplanets. So a lot of people know about the Hubble Space Telescope, did really good, um, uh, made really lovely pictures of the universe, not really built for finding exoplanets, even though it's done a really good job. Um, and then some other ones on the bottom, some of you might know about the James Webb Telescope that's supposed to be launched um, possibly um, next year or after. Uh, but then we got the top row and the top row are all spacecraft and satellites that were specifically built, specially built, just to look for planets outside our solar system or what we call exoplanets. Most of the stuff that we know today comes from this one, Kepler, um, that looked at a tiny patch of sky and just stared at it for ages and listed up loads and loads of planets. And then we've got other ones. We've got TESS that's flying now. Cheops is flying now. Plato will be launched soon. And then we've got Ariel, the one that I'm involved in, which is going to be launched in 2028, that I'll talk a little bit more um, in a bit. But Kepler, especially, just transformed our knowledge of exoplanets. So we went from like a handful in the 1990s to about 4,200 or 4,300 that we know today. So just think about that. In your school books, eight or nine planets. 
right? In real life now, about 4,000 planets have been discovered outside our solar system. These planets come in all shapes and sizes. And if we sort of do it, this is something I got from Kepler itself. And what we've got here is a nice picture. We've got our solar system in the middle. And then we've got all the stars that are near us in the universe and all the planets that are going around their stars. So you see, really, there's a massive family of planets around all the local stars near to us. Some of them are big planets. Their size is bigger if they're big planets. Some of them are hot planets, so they're red on this video, or some of them are colder planets, so they're blue on this video. But there's loads of them, thousands of planets that we didn't know existed. And these planets, they come in all shapes and sizes. Okay, so here we've got a little picture. On the bottom, we've got how long it takes that planet to go around its own star. So that's the planet's year. Okay, so we would be down, um, the Earth would be up here somewhere, right? About 300, 300 days, we'd be around there somewhere. And then up the, up the vertical axis here, we've got the size compared to the Earth. So one would be the same size as the Earth. And then we've got 10 times the size of the Earth. And we've got some planets that are 40 times bigger than the Earth. And then we can divide this sort of picture into um, kind of familiar planets. So the big yellow blob here would be rocky planets. That's stuff like the Earth, it's stuff like Mars and Venus. And then we've got things like the Jupiters. So the gas giants up the top in those pink and purple um, parts. But then we've got stuff that lies in the middle of those. And some of those are gonna be things like um, Neptune and Uranus, so more gas giants. But one thing we have found when looking for new planets is a completely new kind of rocky planet. So in the past, all the rocky planets have been quite small, about the size of Earth. But what we found now is that the rocky planets can actually be divided into two types of planets. And this again is a little, a little picture showing the number of planets and the size compared to the Earth. And we've got these two sort of bumps. We've got the bump here where you see Kepler 452, and that's planets that are about the same size as the Earth. And we know those exist. We know Mars and Venus, Earth, they're all more or less the same size. But then we've discovered this second bump, which is more like you know, between two and four times the, um, the, the size of the Earth. And we call these super Earths or mini Neptunes. And these planets, these super Earths and mini Neptunes were completely unexpected uh, because we thought that we would find planets in other, around other stars that were like Venus and Mars and Earth or like Jupiter and Saturn or like Neptune and Uranus. We didn't expect to find anything in between these sort of size, these size scales. This is a really sort of amazing and unexpected uh, discovery. So what are these sort of planets? What, what are they like? Um, they come in different shapes and sizes. So I'm gonna do a quick sort of tour through the sort of planets that we might expect. So one of the first things that were discovered because they're so big and so close to their stars are these things called hot Jupiters. Now the first exoplanet that was discovered after those dead star planets, so I said was um, 51 Pegasi B. So I should take a little bit of time out now and say, like, why do we call it 51 Pegasi B? So the star is called 51 Pegasi, right? Now, if you find an exoplanet going around a star, because astronomers are not always that imaginative, we give it the star name, 51 Pegasi, and then we say B for the first planet. If you find another planet, we call it 51 Pegasi C, and then D, and then E, then E, F, G. So you know, if you found 26 planets or so going around, around a star, the last one might be 51 Pegasi Z, for example. So not greatly imaginative, but it helps us keep, um, keep track. But this, the, these planets, uh, like 51 Pegasi B, are called hot Jupiters. The reason they're called hot Jupiters is because they are really, really close to their star, their sun. In fact, this one, they're, they're often, they're much closer than Mercury is to our sun, and they whiz around their star, not in 365 days like the Earth, right? They whiz around their stars in a matter of days or hours. So their year, might even take something like 20 hours. That means Christmas would come every 20 hours, right? Every time you go around the sun. Okay, so they're, they're really close and the suns are hot. So you can see from the picture, 
what's actually happening is the atmospheres of these big gassy giants, these big gassy planets, are actually going to be boiled off by the sun. So they're probably reasonably short-lived um, planets because they can't really survive that long so close to their host sun. So those were the first kind of planets that were discovered, these hot Jupiters, again, because they're easy to find. But then we also found um, other weird planets. This is Ke Kepler 16b, and this is about 200 light years away in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. That means that traveling at the speed of light, it would still take you 200 years to get to um, Kepler 16b. Now, Kepler 16b is interesting because it's a planet that's actually going around two stars. So these two stars are close together. We call it a binary, a binary system. And the planet is actually going around both these stars. So this planet would be interesting because in the daytime on Kepler 16b, if you looked up at the sky, you'd actually see two suns in the sky and you'd have two shadows on the ground as well, one from each sun. So also throughout this talk, I like to sort of, um, I, I like to make the point that sometimes science fiction beats us astronomers to actually uh, to the fact here so we've seen a planet with two suns before right if, so anyone anyone who knows star wars knows the planet tatooine there's a planet going around star with two uh, going around um two stars two suns in the sky just like kepler 16b so um, science fiction beat us to it there there's more weirder planets um there's planets that possibly may be made of diamond or have a lot of diamond on them. This is 55 Cancri E. Again, this is one of the first, first, um, one of the first super Earths to be discovered. It's about eight and a half times the, uh, the, the weight of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, and about twice as big. Now, 55 Cancri E is probably made of carbon. On the surface, it may be carbony graphite stuff, but as you go down inside the planet, the pressure starts to increase and that carbon gets forced possibly into diamond. So that's quite a cool planet to visit. If you went there, um, if you went there and um, you know, were able to scoop up some of that surface, you'd come back a billionaire, obviously. Okay, so moving on, there's also planets, rocky planets that are really close to their stars. Um, so these are not gas giants. These are planets like the Earth or like Mercury, for example, but orbiting much, much closer than, than Mercury would. Um, and these are called lava worlds, and they're called lava worlds for obvious reasons because the heat on the surface will be so hot that the surface of the planet will melt. And basically, you've got the whole surface surface of the planet being one big, um, big one big sea of lava. And the other cool thing about these worlds is that um, when a planet goes around the sun, usually over time, just like our moon, in fact, around the Earth over time one side of the planet gets locked facing the sun and one side of the planet gets locked facing away from the sun the moon is the same one side of the moon gets locked facing the earth and one side gets locked facing away from the earth that's why we have a dark side of the moon but the cool thing is about this that that means one side is hot one side is a lot colder one side might be rocky one side might be lava so you could find an ideal place to plant your house on this planet if you could just get that boundary between hot and cold and lava and rock. Okay, so again, this has been captured in science fiction before. Those again, those of you who have seen some of the Star Wars movies, uh, this would be the planet Mustafa. Again, science fiction kind of um, you know beat us to it a little bit. Then there's water worlds. So water worlds are really, really important for us. This one here is Gliese 1214b. Um, it's about 42 light years away. So it would take you 42 years to get there at the speed of light. And we think that this is probably um, larger than the Earth, but probably smaller than planets like Uranus and Neptune. But we think it's got a lot more water and a lot less solid rocky material on it. In fact, it might be covered completely in an ocean of water. Now, it could be a deep ocean, but it's more likely to be quite a shallow um, surface uh, of water on it. And again, these water worlds, they've been predicted. This is interstellar. This is planet Miller orbiting the black hole Gargantua in the interstellar film, the shallow ocean over the entire planet. Okay, so those are most of the different types of exoplanets, um, but they don't always have to go around the sun. Uh, it's possible that there might be rogue planets. There might be thousands and thousands of rogue planets. Now, rogue planets are planets that don't have a sun to go around. Maybe they've been kicked out 
of their own solar system by a big like gas giant like Jupiter because Jupiter can throw stuff around in our solar system as well a little bit. So they might have been kicked out of their solar systems at an early time, but it might be thousands of these rogue planets just wandering, wandering through space, lonely without any suns. So they'd be very dark, cold worlds. And there might also be moons as well going around these, these exoplanets. Um, so there's exomoons as well. Some of these may have been discovered. There's possibilities we may have seen exomoons, but they're really hard to detect. They're really hard because they're so small to detect. But again, you know, these have been done in, you've seen these in science fiction in the film Avatar, the moon Pandora. You've seen it in Star Wars, you have in four. Okay, so again, right, you know, science fiction is, is, is hand in hand with astronomy here. Well, what we're most interested in, everyone, I think probably is, can we find new Earths? Are there planets out there that are just like our Earth? And the answer is probably yes. Um, this one here, Gliese 581c, this is a small rocky planet about 20 light years away. Um, it's about third in order away from its, um, its own sun, but it lives in what we call the habitable zone of its star. So I'm gonna have to um, let's just explain what the habitable zone is. So if you've got a star in the middle, then as you move away from the star, the temperature of planets gets colder and colder, all right? Close to the star, it's too hot. So that would be where Venus is more or less in our solar system. Too far away from the star, starts to get too cold. That would be where Mars is in our solar system. But there's this just right zone. So astronomers used to call this the Goldilocks zone, right? And we call it the Goldilocks zone after um, the story Goldilocks and the Three Bears, where Goldilocks has the three porridges and one's too hot, one's too cold, and one's just right. So the habitable zone, we sometimes call it the Goldilocks zone. Just right means the temperature is just, just hot and just cold enough so that water can exist as a liquid on the surface. And the assumption is that where there's liquid water, there could be life. So are there planets like this out there? All right, so the answer is yes. This is an example. This is the Trappist system. And this was discovered in 2015. So it's quite, it's quite new. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's going around a very small star, a red dwarf. So much smaller, much cooler. Than our, than our own sun. It was discovered by Belgian astronomers who tried very hard to name it after a Belgian beer, I think, hence the name Trappist system. Okay, and it's actually got seven Earth-like planets going around it, three of which are inside its habitable zone. So when this was discovered, this was really exciting. The, the newspapers got hold of this and you had the Daily Express saying, shock, alien discovery, Trappist one planets are habitable to extraterrestrials. Yeah, probably um, you know, a little bit of jump in the gun there, but okay. So these things do lie in the habitable zone of their stars. So it's possible that water might exist on their surface. And the assumption is again, you know, where there's water, there's, there's life. Also in the news, um, I think um, last year in September was this discovery. At the first time water was actually found and identified on a potentially habitable planet as well. So this was discovered um, around um, again, one of these sort of super Earth planets, and and we we actually discovered water in the atmosphere of this planet. So this is a real life discovery of water uh, in a planet's atmosphere. So again, you know, this is starting to get tantalizingly close to saying, are we looking for sort of like biological signatures of life here? Okay, so again, we need to find these things, and there's been a lot of spacecraft. Most of the spacecraft launched so far have been missions that have tried to discover planets. So looking at blank areas of sky for long periods of time and discovering new exoplanets. But what we're trying to do with Ariel, and I should, I should explain Ariel is the name of the satellite. It's not a washing liquid, and it most certainly is not a Disney princess. What we're trying to do with Ariel is actually not discover planets, but we're looking at planets that have been discovered, and we're actually going to try and analyze what they're made of. So to do this, Ariel has to be made with um, various types of um, scientific um, instruments and cameras. So there's the telescope here. If we swap the telescope around on the back, we've then got the um, various instruments and cameras, or even what we use is spectrometers, um, which will spit light into its different colors. Then we put these radiator shields on it. Those gold things are what we call the V-groove radiators, and they help cool the satellite down because we want it to be nice and cold in space. 
and then we stick it on top of what we call the service module, which contains all the kind of um, more, more boring electronics um, that send the data back to the Earth. So Ariel is, is quite a small satellite. It's about one meter, the, uh, the mirror is. But um, that's going to be launched into space, we hope, in 2028, and we're working hard on that now. So how is Ariel going to work? So Ariel is going to look at um, planets that we know already exist around distant stars, and it's going to look at them when they cross the face of their star. We call this a transit when the planet moves in front of its star, because when the planet moves in front of its star, we can do quite interesting stuff with it. So you can see this here, we've got a planet going around a star, and then we're going to flip the orbit around in a minute. And as it moves in front of the star, it makes a shadow on the star and the starlight will drop. So the star gets slightly less brighter when the planet moves across it. So it's almost like it's casting a shadow. I'm just gonna play that again. And on that graph down in the left-hand corner, that's the light from the star. And when the planet moves in front of the star, you can see the light from the star will suddenly drop as the planet blocks some of that starlight. So what can we do with this? The idea is we're going to use this, this, um, this uh, transit, what we call, what we call it. And as the planet moves across the star, what we're going to be able to do is in fact, see the planet's atmosphere. So on this picture here, you can just see this bright ring around the edge of the black dot of the planet, a little, a little golden ring around the planet, uh, around the edge of the planet, which is the planet's atmosphere. Now, the starlight from the sun on its journey to us will actually pass through the atmosphere of that blocking planet. Now, when the starlight passes through the atmosphere of that planet, what we get, in fact, is what we call a spectrum. And some of the starlight passes straight through, some of the starlight actually gets blocked by the atmosphere. And by looking at what gets passed through and what gets blocked, we can actually work out what the atmosphere of that planet is made of. And this example here is actually um, it's not an exoplanet, this is actually uh, uh, Venus, so our own, our own nearby Venus, um, observed by Hinode um, satellite. And when we work out what's in the atmosphere of Venus, we can get what we call um, a spectrum. And this spectrum tells us uh, the composition or what the atmosphere contains. And we can see, for example, in the, in the Venus atmosphere, there's actually some carbon dioxide that we know, but there's also some water as well, uh, which is really interesting. And we've done this for a few of the exoplanets. Hubble Space Telescope has done this for a few of these exoplanets. And you know, it's, it's, found some really, um, it's found some really interesting things in the atmosphere. For example, water in one of the atmospheres of the planets. But what we're trying to do with Ariel now instead is to try and, try and do this for about a thousand exoplanets. So Ariel is going to go and look at about a thousand exoplanets and try and work out what these um, exoplanets are, are made of. So it's going to be launched in 2028 and we're just starting to get into the phase of Ariel now where we're actually going to start building um, pieces of the satellite. It takes a really long time to build these spacecraft. There's a lot of testing, there's a lot of planning. Ariel started, um, you know, um, back in the, the mid 2010s, but we're hoping to launch it in 2028. So that's the thing you have to look out for on the news as time goes on. And we hope to be discovering loads of new stuff um, with Ariel. I think that brings me to the end of my talk. Okay, so thanks for listening. And I think we can do questions. Thanks so much. Um, I do like the idea, oh, I'm just going to put my video back on. I do like the idea of um, sort of the different sorts of planets that you're looking at. I, I still find it quite mind boggling to find out how we can know so much about these things when they're light years away. And we obviously can't send um, telescopes and things to look at them. So we're using kind of indirect methods. Um, we have a couple of questions um, that are coming up um, and you know it's sort of so what is the favorite planet for instance that you looked at but it's also like and how do we know what they look like though <laughs> so 
so I, I can answer. Uh, so I, I can I can answer the the first question about how how you know how do you sort of measure these planets. So so when we when we look at planets um, going across their star, obviously we get some idea of their size as they move across their star. Okay, so we can get a rough idea of how big the planet is because we know how much light gets blocked out of the star. So we understand stars very well, so that means that um, um, any differences in the stars that are due to the planet, we can model quite well to get some idea of the size of the planet. What we also use is um, as as a planet goes around goes around the star. Um, because both of these things um, have, have mass, they have weight. So they tend to, they, they interact with gravity the same way as the reason the earth goes around the, the sun is because the gravity of the sun is so, is so, um, so powerful, it keeps us in the orbit. But the earth also pulls on our sun. So even though the sun is pulling the earth towards itself, the earth is also making a tiny pull on the sun. So that means if we look at the gravitational kind of wobble, and we can do this by looking at the light that we receive, um, we can actually get an idea of how, of how massive these planets are. So if we, know the, if we know how massive the planets are, and if we know the size of the planet because of, of, of it moving across the star, then we can work out the density. Mm -hmm. right? And if we can work out the density, we can work out, is this planet made of rock? Is this planet made of gas? Or is it in between? And if it's in between, it's exciting because it might be made of water as well. Okay, so this is, these, these, these are the sort of tools that we use to, um, to work out what these, these planets are made of. And what Ariel is going to do, um, and what Hubble's done a little bit of, is actually then do chemistry on the atmospheres of these planets and find out what the atmospheres are actually made of. You know, is it hydrogen, helium, carbon dioxide, water, etc. Okay. Uh and then we've got a question about a couple of questions sort of about composition. So there's a question about could water planets far away from their star become ice planets? Yeah. So um, there, there's there, there's a point there's a point around a star that we call actually the the, the snow line, and and the snow line is is where um, more or less water can exist um, in a vapor form or liquid form or whether it condenses into um, ice. So the, the further away a planet is from, from its, um, its parent star, the more likely that water is, um, is going to be um, in a form of ice uh, rather than liquid. However, also, you know, on the Earth, the Earth is actually quite geologically active because uh, of um, you know, the, the, the hot core. So there are other planets um, and moons that also might have a little bit of geological activity or indeed some moons are being kind of massaged by their planets. If it's Jupiter, Jupiter is so massive, it gives its moons a bit of a massage as well. So it heats them up. So even if you've got an icy moon on the surface, there are some moons, for example, like Europa, that even though it's got an ice crust underneath, it might be warm enough that it's got a liquid ocean. So it's possible to have a liquid on planets, um, even if normally they'd be too cold to have it in, in liquid form. Okay. And there was a question about why a planet's round, and you've just talked about massaging a moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, you, you, you can you can kind of do this yourself, right? In, in fact, if you if you've got one of these um, one of these um, Potter's wheels, for example, right, and you put a lump of clay on it and you spin the wheel, I mean, you, you, the, the the shape that comes out in the end is going to be a kind of like a, a round a round shape. And it's this act of spinning as, as these things go around the sun. Um, I mean, orig originally the sun's just like, the sun before the planets are formed is just this big disc of gas and rock. And slowly these rocks start coming together, hitting each other, and they start to condense um, to form what we see as planets. And slowly, um, slowly as gravity takes hold, you get more and more force pushing in from every direction to the middle of the planet, which is gonna form a, a, a spherical shape as well. That's why we don't see any saucers um, around planets. Now we see things <laughs> like um, um, uh, uh, the rings around Saturn. They're obviously the rings, the rings are circular, but they don't, they're not 360 degree spherical. And we think the rings around Saturn are probably um, uh, created by moons that have been, have been destroyed and indeed probably replenished by moons that are being destroyed as well. Okay, so you've talked about the snow line. Um, obviously to have molten rock on these planets, how hot would you say it has to be? So how hot would you say a planet has to be to have molten rock on its surface? So, so, so that, that depends on what the rock's made of. 
<laughs> so if, if you think about if, if you think about the earth for example um you know, on on its surface um we're we're too cold to have molten rock but underneath not too far underneath we, we, get, we have magma being formed um from volcanoes so it depends on, on the melting point of of, of rock so it, it doesn't have to be um 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 you know, like hundreds of degrees would be enough for, the, for these things um uh, to, to, to melt the rock on the on their surfaces. I mean, some some objects. I mean, places like I think even Mercury. I think they're probably they're probably hot enough to melt lead, right? So, it's um and, and Mercury is actually quite far away from our sun compared to some of these exoplanets. So these exoplanets that whiz around in a couple of hours around their sun, I mean that they've got no chance. Everything on their surface is going to be melted. So you mentioned a planet before that had a very hot side and a very cold side. Yep. Would you say there are any of these kind of really close to sun planets that have a cold side, cold enough to maybe even have water? So um, th th there's certainly there's certainly lots of planets. So this this was about um, whether these planets were tidally locked um, to the star, which is why I, uh, I think that was one of the questions in the Q&A as well. So yeah. um, just like our moon is tidally locked, we always see the same face of the moon facing the Earth. Um, all the time, um, we never see the dark side. And likewise, this this is kind of like um, a, a, a result of of how objects orbit other objects. And most of these planets that orbit close to their sun will be tidally locked. Um, and we can see this we can see this temperature contrast on Mercury as well. On I mean, one side of Mercury, the daytime is very hot, the nighttime is very cold. Um, so potentially, there might be. Uh, it, it might be possible to have water um, that exists on these planets. It all depends on whether um, um, water can form in the first place or indeed whether it can survive the planet formation process when the planet is formed so close to its star. OK, so I'm just going to try and bring a couple of questions together. So imagine a situation where you've got a tidally locked planet that is behaving a bit like our moon, um, but a, you know, a tidally locked planet or a tidally locked moon or something like this. So something that's got liquid water on it. But it's got a decreasing, um, you know, orbital kind of absolute height or whatever that's called, and so this planet or moon is gradually kind of getting close to a warmer sort of object, and then the water all kind of eventually kind of evaporates or yeah. just goes away. Um, what would then happen? You'd have no water left on the planet. <laughs> so what would, so, sorry, what would, so, the, so the planet is tidally locked, and it's the water, the kind of movement of the water that's kind of locking um you know maybe locking the kind of as the moon is locked in a sort of we only see one half of the moon yeah. so the planet is effective well, obviously is spinning at the same speed the moon is spinning at the same speed as the earth but say the water um from the planet kind of goes away so you lose that kind of benefit of tidal locking so you've now just got a solid rocky item that's floating around what then happens does it start yeah. spinning or does it maintain its lock so, so I, th I think I th there, there's a misconception here about what tidally locked means tidally locked doesn't mean doesn't mean and has, it hasn't got anything to do with water okay the tight the tidal forces are, are gravitational forces so you don't have to have water on something to be to be tidally locked um the, the, the fact that we see the tides on the earth is because of the gravitational interaction between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and, and the Sun. But the actual the actual words tidally locked just means that you have the same face facing all the time. It doesn't have to have water on it. If something's got water on it and it's tidally locked, it makes no difference whether the water is there or not. It's still going to have that same face facing the um, the star. Okay, so, the, so you're saying the water isn't influencing the Moon, but not the really Moon not. is influencing the water. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that way around. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so there's another question that seems frivolous, but it actually might be quite serious. Um, have you ever seen any kind of evidence for an alien? So um, this is quite an interesting question that probably has um, has changed over the last few months, actually. Um, so I, I guess um, so. So th th there's been no evidence for aliens, right? I mean, there's big telescopes on the Earth, the, the SETI project and stuff that look for aliens. And there's been some that, that there's been sort of various sort of um, um, uh, uh, incidents so in, uh, where you've seen sort of like a, an anomalous um, radio signal. So there's the famous um, wow signal, and um, that was a big radio signal that someone wrote wow about because they thought it was from um, uh, um, aliens. But most of these things are, are either never happened again or have been disproved. However, I mean, it's been in the news recently um, the observations of um, Venus, uh, where 
phosphine has been discovered in the atmosphere of Venus. Now, uh, uh, you've got to be very careful here, here because because the, the thing is, phosphine's been discovered, not alien life has been discovered. Okay, now, but but the the intriguing thing is is that phosphine phosphine is actually a, a byproduct of certain types of bacteria on the earth and it's also quite difficult to form um, by natural means so the discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of venus could point to evidence of uh, microbiological life on on venus but again you know there, there's lots of caveats for this and when this was announced to the press um you know, the, the the people who discovered it we're very, very careful and clear that this is an initial discovery, but there is, there, there is the possibility that we found the first um, biomarkers of, um, of life on, on another planet, which would, you know, which would be sensational. Okay, and there was a question. So we sometimes think about the, um, the, moons, the, uh, the moon Titan as having quite Earth-like sort of qualities. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any kind of sense of where else we might use for or might, where else might we potentially see signs of life, whether they're not produced by life or not, but sort of yeah. these delicate organic molecules. Yeah. So, so Titan's a really good one. Um, again, there might be there might be life on Titan. Who knows? Um, if if we use the premise that um, where there's water, there's life. I mean, there, there's water everywhere. There's water on the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars asteroids there's water absolutely everywhere over the solar system if we want something more for example water plus heat to create life then some of the best places are the icy moons um europa's the best bet as i said as i mentioned in the talk it's got a it's got a thick icy crust but there might be a massive ocean underneath the crust of the planet and that ocean because of the push and pulling of jupiter the the gravitational massaging that ocean might actually um, be heated as well so that would be quite a cool place to look for life. It's a little bit difficult to get to, although um, there have been some ideas uh, for these um, uh, uh, missions that will go to Europa and actually fly through um, geysers on the surface that spurt out um, ice and water and do a sample collection, bring it back to Earth and then analyze that water to see if it's got um, biological life in it, which is quite exciting. Okay, um, and then there's a question about the aerial mission, just to kind of change tack again, is that where are all the parts being made? So obviously you're involved in it, but where, like, how is the consortium kind of working and, and yeah, how is it being made? So the, aer the aerial consortium is, is, is enormous. Um, it's, it's um, the, the, science is, the science and the engineering is, is led from the UK. Uh, but the instruments, the cameras and the spectrometers are being made in France and Poland with the help from the US as well. And most, most European countries, you know, Spain, Italy, um, Hungary, um, I think Sweden are now involved as well. Uh, there, there's Ireland as well. It's a multinational mission just simply because you, you, can't, you can't do a space mission um, as a single country really anymore. E even the US... Even the US building the James Webb telescope, um, the, the, one of the main instruments on it, MIRI, is actually being um, put together and tested in the UK. Um, we, we did the testing at, at Rutherford Affleton Laboratory as well. Okay. Um, and then another question about planets uh, is about Pluto and this sort of, you know, very sad situation it's found itself in. If Pluto is <laughs> not a planet, what is it? It's now classed as a dwarf planet. So to be a planet, to be a planet, you have to be round. <laughs> and, um, and you, have to, <laughs> you have to, um, yeah, you, um, you have to go, you have to orbit around your, your, your sun. So you can't have a moon that's a planet because a moon goes around a planet. And so Pluto does both of those, right? Pluto's round and it goes around the sun, but also you have to dominate or clear your own orbital path. So you, you have to be the big boss in your orbital path around the sun. And that's where Pluto has problems. A couple of problems is its, it's moon, or one of its moons, Sharon, is about the same size as Pluto. The other problem is actually Pluto and Neptune, every so often, they actually swap places. So there is a little bit of period for about 20 years. I think, it have, I think the last time was probably in the 70s, I think, where actually Neptune was the farthest planet in the solar system and not Pluto. So that means that Neptune's really dominating 
Pluto here as well. So it, it fell foul in, in that respect. But it was, as I, as I mentioned, it was a, it was a close call. Um, it, was, it was very argumentative as well. Emotions were running high. You, ha- you really have to give a shout out here to, uh, to Jocelyn Bell, who, who, was, who, who chaired this session. And, and she did a really good job. It was like, sometimes it was, it was chairing a, a, a class of primary school children, I think it looked like. But in the end, in, in the end Pluto, Pluto lost the vote. I, I have to say, I, I voted to keep Pluto a planet. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old guard person here. <laughs> <laughs> but being kicked out on a technicality, oh well. Yeah. Um, so what discoveries do you think we need to make before we can find um, a new exoplanets or new exoplanets or are they being found all the time? So exoplanets are being found all the time. Kepler, Kepler operated for um, uh, uh, quite a few years and found um, um, thousands and now we've got TESS um, which is a, an American satellite and that's going to more or less survey the entire sky and we're already getting the first results from TESS in. So TESS is already feeding us new exoplanets and will continue to do so um, for as long as it flies. Then we've got Kiops as well, it's launched, that's discovered new planets. Plato will be launched um, in the next few years to discover it. So discovery is not a problem. The, the issue is, and this is why Ariel is being built, the issue is once we've got all those discoveries, because this is kind of a little bit like um, um, stamp collecting, really. You know, you're finding lots and lots of planets, adding it to sort of like the lists of different sizes. But what we really want to do now is start to do chemistry on these planets and that's this is why area was so important because it's going to look at the atmospheres and find out what all these new planets being discovered are actually made of okay uh just trying to go through some of the questions uh so there was a question about the surface of okay going to a moon now so the surface of our moon um and so you see photographs of the surface of the moon and the sort of dust on it and bits of stones and things and it's all quite loose whereas some of the uh, images that we've been talking about feel like a solid rock mm. that's just flying around uh, in space why is it that there are you know pebbles and stones and dust and stuff on the surface of these planets and moons when um when there's no gravity is okay, the question so, okay so so the simple answer to the question is yes there is gravity on the moon it's about one sixth the si- one sixth as powerful as the earth um but there's certainly gravity because the gravity just depends on how on how massive or how or how dense um a, 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 a body is so the moon's smaller than the earth that's why that's why we can jump around and bounce around the earth but it still does have have gravity likewise there's some planets um that have got uh, that are much bigger than the earth and the gravity is so strong that it would actually squash us but the moon has pebbles it has moon dust you know if you went to the moon you've seen we've all seen footprints on the moon um, and that's obviously footprints in in the moon dust as well okay uh because i think there's a lot of interest about sort of the surface kind of you know what's on the surface of these planets so a lot of questions about sort of water and dust and stones and things um how long does it take? I mean, obviously the planet's going to have to kind of move significantly away from its star to kind of change its temperature or be influenced by another um, by another kind of gravitational squashing things that we kind of talked before is that you can change the temperature of a planet without using solar or stellar heat. You can just use gravitational kind of squeezing. How frequently would you say the kind of surface topology or surface kind of, you know, morphology of a planet or might change how long will it take to kind of change something significantly, do you think? So it always, it always depends how close the planet is to its star or if it's a moon, how, how close it is to its, um, its parent planet. And we see this in our own solar system. We've got, um, we've got Jupiter and we've got one of Jupiter's moons, Io, going around it. Now, Io is the most volcanically active body that we know of. And Io is volcanically active because it's, it's, it's continually being squashed and stretched by Jupiter, um, you know, on you know, on a on a daily basis, really here, uh, because the contrast between the size of Io and the size of Jupiter is 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 so much. Um, the further away you are, the gravity gets um, a bit becomes um, um, less less pronounced. So for the Earth going around the Sun, most of the tides, the water tides on the Earth, are caused by the Moon. However, there are times. As the, as, as the earth goes around the sun, that the sun and the moon gang up on us. 
and we get an effect of the sun's gravity as well. And this is what calls some of these, um, these super tides. I think sometimes that you can see on TV um, where the, you see these tides running up the Amazon that happens once every year or something like that. But that's caused not just by the moon, it's a combination of the moon and the sun and indeed Jupiter, you know, and indeed Venus and Mars and Mercury, they all contribute to the gravitational attraction on the earth. It's just that the, they're so small that we don't really notice them. We really only notice the moon and the sun for us really, because they're the two biggest things. So this idea when we kind of have that phrase, it's in popular culture, isn't it? When all the planets and stars align, weird things happen. Yeah. Um, and that's why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so if, you're, if you're nicely aligned, I mean, now at the moment, Mars is, is in sort of, is in opposition to us, right? It's, it's very bright in the sky. So effectively, the, the, the Mars, Mars has a bigger effect on us now than it would when it's around the other side of the sun from us. Although it's such a small planet, it's one tenth the size of the Earth. You know, it, it's very difficult to see this effect, really. OK, and then I think we're, we might be drawing to a close. I think we've overrun a little bit, but um, I'm totally OK with that. Uh, there is a question. What is your favorite? What is the favorite? What is your favorite planet um, and why? Oh, Obviously, my favorite... Earth excluded. Earth excluded. <laughs> solar system, a favorite exoplanet or favorite planet? OK, both. You can have one solar <laughs> and you can have one. Non -solar. I like I mean, in, in, inside the solar system, my, my favorite, I think my favorite planet is Mars. I, I think I think I like Mars because it's it seems to be the best chance we have to go somewhere else in, in the solar system and 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 colonize. Right, so I think I think Mars is quite attractive in that respect. Um, okay. In terms of in, in terms of exoplanets, um, I, I I quite like the water worlds um, because I, th I think they I think they'd be absolutely astounding to uh, to, to visit uh, the, the entire the entire surface of a planet just covered in, in water. And if, if for example, what what would the uh, what what would the sort of like the atmosphere interaction with the water be? Would there be massive storms at all, for example? Uh, would we see super tidal waves on this on this planet? So I think they're they're quite uh, they're quite interesting as well. Okay, well, I think we're sort of coming to the end of what we should really have um, available for us. So there are more questions which uh, you know we could sort of stay on here for another kind of half an hour or forty minutes easily, um, but I'm going to draw it to a close. Um, there are a couple of. Uh, activity stations in the explorer zone where people are on hand to ask any of these questions and more and so there's um the UKAA um UK Atomic Energy Authority that's trying to make a sun on earth so there was a question about how the sun is formed so I would go over to making a sun on earth and send it that way um, there is seeing the invisible which is another STFC booth and I'm sure there are people are on there that will be able to answer some more space-based questions and there's particle physics adventures too that can help you probe different aspects of kind of physics and um, the universe. I know they're supposed to be talking about particle physics, but I'm sure they'll ask other questions, answer other questions uh, about um, space. And there was a question, there was some kind of comments on this sort of diamond based planet, which I really like the idea of. Uh, and there's a, a booth uh, run by Element 6, and they're all about making. Uh, diamonds synthetically so understanding kind of diamond uh, production technologies in industrial kind of situations so there's plenty of more uh, opportunities to ask questions uh, I think though uh, we've had a really good session with Chris uh, thanks so much for kind of sharing that sort of stellar and out of this world kind of description of how things are formed and how we're trying to understand a little bit more about them uh, so we can understand our place in the universe a little bit more clearly uh, thanks so much thanks for all the questions